This is the Messiah Hour with Ari Lewis. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports News Radio. At any time, you can email the program, messiahhour at gmail.com, or you can email the station, Israel Sports and News Radio at gmail.com. Those fans who've been following the website for the past few weeks have noticed that we've not had a new episode of a new interview with Rabbi David Katz. That's because he's been out of the country. He is back. We're going to interview him and talk about his trip. So on the line right now, our favorite rabbi, actually not from Spot anymore, a different city, co-author of the book, The World of the Gare, back to the program, Rabbi David Katz. Rabbi, how are you doing out there? Thanks, sorry for me back and uh, just flew in and blew my arms tired. There you go. Chin, you'll be at the... Ramada all week. Now, Don't get the tip to wait stuff. Is there a Ramada in Modine, by the way? Uh, yeah, it's just around the corner. Okay, right. I mean, it's probably halfway built because all Modine is like halfway built. So. Don't go to, like, the top floor of the Ramada. Now, you were in a few countries. Uh, let's start first with South Africa. What was that like? What were some of the things you did out there? I know you had a lot of speaking engagements, so tell us about it. Well, since I was only a couple thousand miles away from Antarctica, we can actually start from there. It is quite logical. <laughs> so, <laughs> what it, people, In my lectures, I often speak about, well, should there be a Nazarite community coming up from Antarctica? So I... I Next time I go to South Africa, I do want to fly to Antarctica just for the sake of you know, tell people I went to the Antarctica. Um, well, there probably is a Chabad house in Antarctica. <laughs> probably is. Because uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of researchers down there. Who knows? So, um, yeah, I, I went to South Africa for – I think it was about a week I was there. Probably the time of my life. I mean it was it was incredible. Um, just to give you a, I mean, the, the, you kind of left it wide open and we're going to be talking about it for a little bit, but I guess I'll introduce why I was there. I mean, in terms of the original premise of why I was there, I was contacted about a year and a half ago by a, the leader of a Noahide group in Cape town. And he goes by the name of Jacques. And he contacted me with his with his rabbi. His rabbi's name is Brian Opert. And they contacted me on Skype about a year and a half ago. And they they said you know they they wanted uh, to get acquainted with me, my program, whatever my program is to them. Um, all these things about what 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 I do. So we talked, and shortly afterwards, relatively shortly afterwards, Brian came to Spot when I was living in Spot. And we hit it off. He's a really great guy. And he learned the Gare world learning of Torah in about three to four hours. He got hit with every source in the book. And we became friends. And I had a, work, a working relationship with Jacques. And after I came back from Texas, Texas was a great trip last summer. And I contacted Jacques and I said, it's about time we uh, we do Texas 2.0 in, 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 the, in, the, in the Cape. So we came together. I'm actually going to be doing the next leg of that whole thinking. I'm going to be going to Chicago in a couple of weeks, and that trip's going to be Chicago, Cleveland, Montreal, New York. And that's what was conceived around the time of the Chagim, of really continuing the momentum of a successful launch of the books in, in Texas, and Cape Town finally came to fruition. Um, I flew in through London, which we'll, I guess we'll talk about, um, part of the, the package, how I was able to, to get to Cape Town from those that – organized the trip, uh, met some people in London, got to Cape Town, met Jacques. We hit the ground running. We didn't look back. We had nonstop action, meeting with rabbis in town, uh, Noah Hyde, you know, proper from Cape Town and surrounding areas. Joe Berg people came down, and uh, it was a massive success. They actually coined the term Nilva, which is a term, a synonym used with gear and it's an, and it's a replacement for gear in, in terms of the profits and um they actually had hats made up cuz they they really took to the word nilva which means attached to god and they have a, a you know i have a, a group on facebook called i get gear and so now they called themselves and branded on the hats i get nilva so it was an awesome time met awesome people and there were relationships forged for the future and it looks like um i'm kind of the working rabbi for the group and we have a lot of expectations to, for the future, and the goal is to get a, a Noahide Gear Center built in Cape Town, and it was just an amazing time all around. 
How much do you think this no-hide movement has progressed in the last 15, 20 years in Cape Town or South Africa in general? I don't know, because there's a lot of private groups what I came I, uh, I came to learn about. Jacques' group was more of the modern incarnation of Noahide, which is leaving the church. Um, there was no gear at that time. Was, you know, the term came about with our with our teachings in the book. Uh, we didn't invent the word. It's been around for over 3,000 years in the Torah. Obviously, it's since actually Adam. Um, it just came out now in terms of an applicable term for the Noahide movement that began in the 70s and 80s. But a lot of groups of Noahides today are not from that original Vendel Jones crew. A lot of it is at the turn of the millennium and the Internet, with Internet research becoming a viable option, a lot of people left the church in the early 2000s. A lot of people. And that turned into study groups, which became Hebrew roots and Messianic Judaism. Um, they just had nowhere else to go. They really gave up Jesus a long time ago. It, there was just there was nowhere else to go, and conversion wasn't in the cards, either not possible or not interested. And Noahide never really did it for them. But around the turn of the decade, they turned to Noahide because there just was no other option. The kosher establishment only recognizes Noahide. So there was nowhere else to go. Surprise of the matter is the Torah itself has Noahide built in to the Torah of Moses. And that's called ger. Because remember, Noahide is an English word. Ger means Noahide in Hebrew. One of the, one of the ways you can understand what, what, what ger and Noahide are about. So when they had nowhere else to turn to, um, this group that I work with in particular, and I know there's a lot of other groups, Noahide just became the default. Nobody actually wanted it. Um, I mean, maybe some people did, but it wasn't like a universal decision. Uh, it was just embraced by enough rabbis and enough existing, pre-existing Noahides that Noahide was the, the term. But since then, um, Noahide really is not the word, and, and people are are not satisfied with the word. And I, I don't think gear is a satisfactory term. It's just called people. <laughs> um, gear is kind of a code word to get into the Torah, but you can also use nilva. You can use gear. Um, in the Talmudic terms, you have chassidi, almost a olam, almost a olam, gear, gear, toshav, gear, tzedek. I mean, there's many, many terms. Gear is just the term used in the five books of Moses, written by Moses himself. Uh, and, and in proper context, so that's why we use gear. Um, the the groups themselves need not call themselves gear. There's many options, like I said. So we're we're breaking into the next strata where authentic Torah learning is happening, uh, proper observance is happening, and the authentic ancient path is being um, revealed. But only on this side of World War II, pre World War II, this was all known by the establishment. Much of the establishment was destroyed in World War II. And now that there's people to fit the establishment uh, in the Torah, the, the the rabbinics is coming back to life. So they actually preceded us um, in the last couple decades. But now, due to the massive increase in numbers in Cape Town, South Africa, worldwide, Judaism is bouncing back post-World War II in every way, right? I mean, Israel is a post-World War II success story. So the, our Noahide Torah is also a post-World War II success story. Our Torah is, is growing, and the non-Jews uh, believing in the God of Israel is also, Baruch Hashem, growing very nicely. Do you think this is all a sign of the Messianic era? Because there's a concept that the, the truth will really come out and things will be done properly. Do you think that's a sign of that? Yes, but I will never say that. Meaning, it absolutely is 100%, but the definition of Ger is it is not a Messianic movement. So... The idea of Gare is it's really living redemption now. I mean, that, because look, look at it this way, Ari. Um, we're in exile as Jews, right? Yeah. But technically, we can live Geula lifestyles if we understand the wisdom of Torah, correct? Right. I mean, for, well, one thing, example, living in Israel is a Geula lifestyle. Exactly. Exactly. So the non Jew is that for them. You know, just do what you just did for them. That's what gear is. Okay. It's not illegal to live here. 
Right. It's not illegal to be gay. Case in point. Perfectly said. Do you think, though, there are others that do think it is illegal to discuss gay or be gay or those type of things? No, no, nobody says that. The only contention is in the terminology. Um, and the terminology based on sources that they don't want to look up. Are we allowed to live in Israel, Ari? Sure. Maybe not. There are plenty of people who say no. Well, same thing. Same thing. Okay. Just as much as it's a ridiculous question, but people ask it, same thing. Is is Rav Cook a Russia for setting up Judaism in Israel? No, I don't think so. Exactly, but there are those that do. I mean, the, the some Haredi sectors make it like he is like the worst thing ever. But if you look at Rav Cook teachings, he's phenomenal. I mean, he was phenomenal. Same thing here. Okay. Which, by the uh, way, he set up Gare, by the way. He was the father of Gare. You should know that. So tell us more about that. How did he exactly set up Gare? It, you go to you went to Super Saul Deal a year ago, I'm, I'm guessing. Probably, at some point. And you probably saw cucumbers for sale there. Right. Did you ask yourself why they can be sold there since it's the Shemitah year? Uh, well, I knew because there's, I guess, a loophole, if you want to call it. The Heter, Heter Mechira. Yeah. What makes the Heter Mechira work, and why was it instituted? Well, um, I mean, it was instituted by Rob Cook, right? Yes, but here's the story. Ready? Okay. I'm going to say it really yeshivish just for, 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 for giggles. Okay. <laughs> when we come back to Israel, Ari Lewis, in the year 1920, are you with me? I am. We have to ask ourselves, is the land of Israel remaining with its original holiness? What would you say, Ari Lewis? Uh, still, I mean, still have its holiness. It's not like holiness. That's what you say, but it's a question amongst the rabbis. Some say it is mamish holy as the day Yahushua ben Nun conquered the land of Israel. Some say it's mamish not holy at all, not until Mashiach comes. So if it's not holy, then there's no Shemitah, no problem, right? Just do what you got to do. It's like living in Boston, just in the the Middle East. But if it is holy, then we have to adhere to the Torah's edicts of how to live properly in the land, even though on a rabbinic level. So the Haredim hold on the side of stringency to, to guard the Shemitah, they will have uh, properly guarded food that is for sure not a problem with Shemitah laws. The resting on the land of the seventh year, correct? Yep, correct. But the seculars don't hold of the Shemitah. And if the land is holy, which it might not be, but if it is holy... They would be doing a lot of sins. Is that correct, Dari Lewis? Uh, yes, that sounds correct to me. But we don't want them to sin, do we? No. So how do we prevent 7 million Israelis from sinning if the sin is, in fact, a sin? We have to find a loophole. So we will sell the land of Israel. Then it is rested in the seventh year. But you cannot sell the land to an idolater. You need a Gertoshav to sell it to. The Muslim is the lowest common denominator Gertoshav on the level of Akum, technically by Halacha, but he has rejected idolatry by the doctrines of his book, the Quran, even though it is a heretical book because a true Gertoshav cannot have a religion. So they sold the land to a Muslim, and thereby all of the produce is not uh, transgressing a biblical crime. How do you like that, Ari Lewis? That's pretty complex. That's right. And to make that happen, Rav Cook implemented the Ger Sugias, the Ger Talmudic passages. So if I, David Katz, am wrong in my gear research, then 
Rav Cook was wrong in his gear research, because I'm learning it the same way he did. And if he's wrong, every year people transgress theoretically biblical law. But if Rabbi Cook was right, and I think we have reason to believe he was right, because today every rabbi on the planet supports that, that learning, and the rabbis of that time supported the learning, maybe not the, the, the hashkafa behind should we be in Israel, but not the learning of Rav Cook. So, so too, Rav Cook's learning was apropos and correct. So too, today, the Gare learning is exactly the same as Rav Cook. It is not a question. If there is a question, it is that people just don't want it. There are people that don't want Heter Mechira because they don't want to rely on a Muslim. There are people that don't want Gare because they don't want to rely on whatever they, they see as a potential danger in the philosophy, but not in the actual Torah of it. Again, this is the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports and News Radio, joined by Rabbi David Katz, co-author of the book, The World of the Gare. And so Rabbi, I'm sorry, what's that? <laughs> and so was all, yes, and so was all, right. And uh, just came on a spe speaking tour, a travel tour, etc. Did you get to speak about the book at all with the people of South Africa? I did. And would you believe the way I, pr I published the new book, Soul Mazel, available on Amazon.com for $22. Um, Amazon, we use the Amazon to, to, to promote, publish, and, and print and everything in the book, right? So it's ironic. People have bought the book. It's actually sold a million copies. You might want to hurry up and get one before we sell out. Um, but I'm, shh. but I, I actually that would, never had. Huh? Well, if that if that was true, I would I would probably ask a couple of bucks for me. I mean, it'd, be, it'd be twenty million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I know Amazon gets a cut of it. Yes. Yeah, so I I went on the trip just uh, as the book was coming out on Amazon. Just it was just timing. Was my editor Miriam Vinyakov just had it up right when the trip was going to go. So I never had a copy, and I had people on Facebook posting pictures of their copy. I, I'm thinking that's nice, but I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm really not interested in buying my own book to get a copy. So in South Africa, they actually had it. Jacques had it ready, and there's a picture of it on um, on Facebook, me holding the book for the first time. I had to actually get my first copy from Jacques, but then that didn't work out. The, the, the woman who brought me down uh, to Cape Town, the actual executor of the – executioner, executor, whatever you say, of the trip – I gave her my copy of the book, and then Jacques had to give me his last copy. So uh, in the end, I, I do have a copy of the book. Um, it's pretty cool. It was it was headlined in, in the trips in the, in the talks down there, um, even though it was mostly a world of the gear experience because that's what people know mostly by now. But yeah, the book is going. It's 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 basically world of the gear on steroids um, from my original articles and lectures from years ago, and it was the basis of what world of the gear. Was in, in Torah terms, Ari, have you ever heard of the Shulchan Aruch? Yes, a little bit. World of the Gear is the Shulchan Aruch. Have you ever heard of the Tor? Sure. Uh, and the Base Yosef? Yes. That's the Soul Mazel book. So it's it's like the raw oomph, whereas World of the Gear is really refined, uh, laid out. I mean, it, it was a craftsmanship like uh, the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, as a rabbi, uh, I'm I'm most impressed with the Shulchan Aruch by its craftsmanship. Rabbi Yosef Karo's language is is beyond beautiful. Um, Chaim has a really wonderful and beautiful language as well, and that's what the world of the gear is. Um, I'm more of a base Yosef fan, which is the same person, by the way. It's just the base Yosef commentary. Yosef Karo is the base Yosef commentary in the original Shulchan Aruch, which is the body of law of Judaism. Um, he's not trying to be eloquent and beautiful. He's trying to jam-pack everything that's 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 in the world on that idea into that commentary. And this is like the earliest um, authoritative halacha we have. Shulchan Aruch, which is the same guy, but he just leaves out the process and tells you in a really refined, even poetic fashion, the law. I would say in my Sul Mazel book, I just jammed every idea of gear possible in there, which... The Beis Yosef is a great read um, if you're a bit of a scholar. That's why I, I compare the Sol Mazel book, whereas the, the World of the Gear, you, it is scholarly, just like the, the Shulchan Aruch, but you don't need to be a scholar to get into it. I think with the Shulchan Aruch also, which are you probably have learned what's called the Mishnah Brura, right? Sure, yep. 
which is like the super refined of the Shulchan Aruch, written by the Chafetz Chaim, or the the master of Lush and Hara. Um, you don't, you certainly don't need to be a rabbi to learn the Mishnah Bura. That's the beauty and brilliance of the Chavetz Chaim, and even my Chavetz Chaim, Chaim, <laughs> Chaim Korfin, uh, whereas my stuff, it's not that. It's it's certainly not for the uninitiated. Okay, so it, then how could more people access to it if they don't, I guess, have some type of foundation? Uh, so my, I, I, I think that they, they can have a different foundation. Um, someone who left the church who's done Bible study, uh, they would like the, the Soul Mazel book. A secular looking to get spiritual, do not buy the Soul Mazel book. It's not for you. Um, if you don't know the, about the Torah portions and the Bible characters, you have, you're going to be scratching your head all day long. But if you have enough Bible in you, you can get the book. Chaim's book is, uh, I mean, our book, but it's, as Chaim wrote it, um, I would say even the secular can really get a lot out of it. That, that's the brilliance of the world of the gear. Um, I don't think it's as good for the Bible scholar, though. And most most people in our world, the Noahide world, they do have extensive Bible background. Most, uh, and the Jews in Israel, for example, uh, have a lot of Bible background. So it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a market, so to speak. It just does require a little bit of background. Um, I think smartphones are the same thing, aren't they? Uh, my mother is, bless her heart, she has a smartphone. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, very good. So uh, maybe Solazal is a more advanced book? Do you want to say that? Um, people that get smartphones have computers. People that don't have computers certainly won't get the smartphone. Okay, gotcha. All right. So uh, talk a bit also about uh, some of the experience you, you made, some of the people you met, and how that's going to influence you a bit going forward in the future. So th I met a lot of – I mean everybody I met was awesome. But I think what set the tone for the trip was I was in London, Edgware, and um, I stayed with a, a lovely chap. His name was Lawrence Davidson and De Debbie Davidson in Edgware. Across the street from Ollie's, a Halavi restaurant. So uh, I stayed in this little like little neighborhood of, of, of uh, it's cute. It was like a little Orthodox neighborhood. I mean, you got the kosher restaurants, you got the the shtibel, kolel, nice mikveh, um, real small neighborhood in terms of Orthodoxy, but it was nice. It's the Edgeware community. And uh, David Dome, uh, kind of a Facebook personality, we became. Uh, strong mates, if you can call it that. And um, he set it all up. I was learning and in, in, in davening at the shtibel, and it was it was a it was a preparation for South Africa. And I, I only went there logically because the I had a, a layover in London, and one of the options was if you're going to be there, you know, make a, a gear trip out of it. So I did. I was there for a couple days. And the highlight was I had an appointment with Rabbi Akiva Tatz. Ari, have you ever heard of Akiva Tatz? Yeah, I've heard a little bit. Yeah, he's a world-renowned lecturer. And I thought I was getting uh, the short end of the stick. He's like, yeah, you know, come and you know, I'll give you half an hour. I'm like, oh, thank you. Great. <laughs> you know, I thought it was nothing. But uh, I was very impressed with Rabbi Tatz. His half an hour is a half an hour. Right? It's not like, hey, David, sit down. I'm going to come late. And we'll tell me, why do you come to my office? Oh, great. That's nice. Wow. Hold on one second. I got a phone call. Wasn't that? He, he brings me into his office on time. New. Let's go. I, he's like prepared. He knows about my work. He's ready to go. He's, he's just, he, tell me. I'm like, wait a minute. You're supposed to give me the schmaltz and the waste of my time. And I'm supposed to walk out with a frown. He's like, I, mean, I didn't say that, but that's the energy. He's like, tell me. I'm like, okay, hold on. Wait me wake up out of my moron man mode. For those that know my Michelin class, I'm like, okay, no moron man. Waking up, I'm saying, wait a minute. So you, are you actually saying you want to hear what I have to say? And you want to hear the whole story? That's what I'm thinking in my brain, right? So I say, right. I, what I actually said to him was, okay, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with everything I got from different angles and so try to keep up. He says, let me have it. So I did. 
I gave him gear, like Rambo style, as people know I can do. And he was loving it, loving it. Boom, 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 boom. And he was asking me really great questions. He's smiling. There's actually a picture on Facebook with uh, we got a selfie. Um, is he? I actually have like the tough guy look, and he's smiling ear to ear. Um, I only had the tough guy look because I just got done uh, giving him Rambo style gear sources. And he had a, a very difficult question. He's like, he says he wants a source where the non-Jews, the Noahide, have a mitzvah of fruitful and multiply. And most people will be like, look. You know, God says in the Torah that dogs are to reproduce, and um, yeah, yeah, you can say all, all the most, so the, the non-Jews have to reproduce. So that that's what most people could have thinking would do. I showed it was written that Noahide uh, has a mitzvah to do per uh, It's a Gemara in Chulin 92a, in the Ein Yaakov commentary, based on the Tractate of Sanhedrin, says explicitly, explicitly that. So he saw that I'm kind of like the guy that has answers to the weird questions. And he says, Rabbi Katz, people have to know this. And it's like people in my field, we have to know this. He said, I said, okay, I know. That's why I'm here. And he said, wait, this has to be a book. Like the sources, these sources have to be a book. I said, look, I'm a one-man show in terms of the infrastructure. Um, I need help. If you want to get people on this book idea, let me know. So he said, uh, all right, well, we got to find someone to help you, like, actually put this together. So that's where it was, and it was it was a great experience, and he's very much on board. He was very happy. So it was it was a great experience. I actually met the head of the jail, what's called the JLE, in, in uh, Golders Green, Rabbi Kirsch. He was excited. They would have had me give a sheer if I would have been there one more day, but I had to hit the road and go to South Africa. So that that experience and that energy and that style – that's what followed me to Cape Town. And in Cape Town, I met with several rabbis. Uh, all but one of them was super excited. The, la the one that was not super excited, uh, it just wasn't his work. He said, you know, uh, Rabbi Katz has a passion for this, and he's on a mission with it. it I don't share that same mission, but I salute him in his work. And I said, you know what, fair enough. Um, it was a bit of an uncomfortable experience, but uh, it let me know that even the people that are not totally on board with being proactive in this are, are still recognizing the truth of the message. Um, the people, personalities, we had an all-day conference on the Sunday. That we literally learned, and pay attention already to what I'm going to say, we learned from 9 in the morning till 2 in the morning, straight. 9 till 2. Wow. Yeah, it was insane. And they had, like, the South African meat, unlimited hamburgers coming, uh, kosher at the Bri Brian's house, the rabbi there. Um, Shabbos at Orsameach. I uh, give a sheer shallow shootus. I mean, it was dynamite. Every personality was was amazing. Uh, met amazing people at the meals. Uh, the guests. I'm actually in class. Uh, people that they're, the people that were the guests Friday night, where I was a guest also. That they're taking classes with me now. Everybody was inspired. It was hugely inspiring, exciting. It was incredible. It was a, it was a time in my life in that regard. Again, this is the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports News Radio. Joined by Rabbi David Katz, uh, co-author of the book *The World of the Gear*, author also of *Sol Mazal*, talk about his recent trip abroad. So I'm curious, Rabbi, about what people said to you regarding living in Israel. If they were curious about what that is like. Um, I would say the opposite. I was there telling them that Cape Town looked a lot like Israel. <laughs> hmm. uh, that's what was shocking to me. We're driving around, and it really looked a lot like Israel. A lot. Uh, the only thing that didn't was, you know how Israel on the, the roads, we have a, we have a very um, indicate, um, indications on the road that's very, very indigenous to Israel, you know, the, the, the signs and road markers and things. Right. So yeah. that was missing. So that was missing. Uh, but hmm. the, the terrain was, was very just kind of, I would say exactly like Israel, but it was, I was in familiar territory. Let's put it that way. Um I felt like I was part of them. I really felt at home. And the, the Texan guys said, "If you you know you could put a bunch of cowboy boots on these guys, they're just they're just universal <laughs> people." You know, I I don't know if anybody that was not represented by them. Not that I've been all around the world, but um, I, they were just amazing people. If they were uni if there's a universal message in Noahide gear, these guys they are universal people. They are just that that's what Cape Town is. It's just. In fact, I went to the Table Mountain. You know, you know. Have you ever seen pictures of Cape Town, Ari? 
I've seen a couple. Yeah, I haven't heard of Table yeah, Mountain. Yeah, so though. it's incredible. I was up there. I went on top. It's the mountain range that's like on every picture from South Africa from Cape Town. And I'm standing okay. in line. Standing in line. Uh, uh, standing in line. That's an old joke. <laughs> that's an old ego goodie from my uh, comedy club days. Um, I was standing stand in line there, and I hear, Mazze! Lama does omit pool. No. And I'm like, what? Wait, what? What? <laughs> what? He's like, no. Efu imushulcha. Lama ilupo. So I said, me efu tem. I said, they were Israelis from Cologne. They're like, wait a minute. Why are you speaking Hebrew to us? I'm saying, why are you speaking Hebrew to me? Right? So it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool to be first first time in my life. Because um, I haven't been out of Israel hardly ever. But imagine I'm standing there in Cape Town, a table mountain, speaking Hebrew to some family. <laughs> I mean, that just really set the tone. It really set the tone. It made it Hamish and warm. But uh, my understanding is that South Africa is a very Zionist type of country. The Jews are really into Israel. I mean, did you pick up that? hundred percent. When I was in Texas, I was really upset only in the fact that Israel was like beyond far. I mean, you remember how, uh, you know, you and I talk a lot, right? Um, and I stopped doing sure. a radio show with you when I was in Texas. I mean, you were like on the other side of the world to me. My kids were on the other side of the world to me. It was horrible. I mean, I really felt disconnected to my kids. It broke my heart. I mean, it was bad. There was no Israel. South Africa, number one, I never called home, only because the Wi-Fi was horrendous. So I couldn't get on Wi-Fi. But it's like it didn't matter. Everything there was Israel. And I, also in London, by the way, in Edgeware, it was all about Israel. So I, I never felt out of Israel. I mean, everyone there is just so beyond in tune with Israel and in an authentic way. You know, in America, it's like, yeah, I'm going to Israel and I'm going to be buying the Coca-Cola shirt in Hebrew. That's not South Africa. Um, they are very with it, very authentic. And their Judaism is not American Judaism. It is so neshama. I mean, I mean, you probably as well as I do know South Africans in Israel, right? And, and they're different than the Americans. Not not in their humanity, but in their Judaism. Um, it's just, it was incredible. I don't know. It just was a, a real warm neshama pro-Israel. Just, you know what it was? It, it was, it, I mean, they have their politics and their garbage too. But, but, but it's like in London, everything is a little bit more comfortable, a little bit more dainty. Their Judaism is is a little bit more dainty than our American Judaism. You know, they don't have the the, the anti-Israel or the anti-Haredi, all those little things that just upset people. Even anti-Gare. Everyone there got Gare. That's what was the best part of South Africa. Did you notice or have the feeling that in, let's say, uh, Texas, that if you're walking around with a yarmulke, did you get any anti-Semitism? No. Or in any well, place, actually. That's a non-question, and I'll tell you why. Okay. I never yeah. asked a non-question before. I'll be curious. Okay, <laughs> no, right. I'll tell you why. It's a, it's, it's a great <laughs> question. It has nothing to okay. do with your yarmulke. It has to do with you. If you walk around, hmm. I'm a Jew, I'm better than you, go yeah. away. They're going to treat you like Jew, right? You might get spit on. Who knows? If you walk around with or without yarmulke, I mean, obviously I was with yarmulke, but if you walk around and your heart and your mind, you're saying, I mean, just, I'm not saying literally in your mind, but imagine the energy going out, pro gear, love gear, pro gear, Hashem loves gear, <laughs> don't taunt the gear. I mean, like, I, my, my Kavana, I walked down Sea Point on Shabbos, I went from one guy's house to the Shal Shudas, right? And I, I haven't walked in the public sector on Shabbos maybe ever. So it was very awkward for me. Very awkward to be like in a downtown on Shabbos. Very strange. Hmm. In spot, it's like all old city, right? Um, so I had I had people come up to me and say, Shabbat Shalom, it's all about the Jews. You guys are amazing. You pray for us. My kavana was just be honest. I'm here for Gare. I love Gare. You guys are probably Gare deep down, not you know Shomer Mitzvahs, but and it worked. 
I, I mean, I had like real like I mean, I was in like a slum area part of downtown at points. It goes it goes from like good area to bad area very quickly, you know. And and guys were like looking at me. I mean, I'm wearing black and white yarmulke, right? I had guys that are rough riders look at me, and I'm thinking like. I'm not with stigma here. I you're just probably a Garrett doesn't know it yet. That's my attitude. I don't know if it's true. They could be total idolaters. But my attitude, my resonance, right, is I'm not against you. I'm not, I'm with you. And, and in a tour of lingo in my brain. And they all said the ones that 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 made contact with me all said good shots. Literally in those words. Yeah. Wow. It was it was awesome. And I saw a couple from Jews. So they're probably used to from Jews on Shabbos. But I, d- I got five people in Seapoint to go out of their way to tell me good jobs. Hmm. Okay, so that's that's a good oh, sign. Yeah. Oh, that, it was a good that, shame. Were you, were you surprised by that? Yes and no, but no because I'm so into gear stuff. I'm used to getting gear stuff all the time. Um, in the cable car ride up to Table Mountain, uh, me and Jacques were standing there. And... Um, this woman said, like, you have uh, – she was from – I forget where she was from. It was a tourist. She was from South Africa. But she's like, you're the Jew. You have such a nice beard. You know, then she puts her hands and goes, you pray, you pray. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> so, I mean, this is my mazel. I'll, I'll even tell you a funny story from today in Israel, right, just for, for giggles, right? Me and my sure. – we just moved to Modin, as you mentioned. So I don't – I'm not, like, <laughs> known here or familiar here. And in Sfat, I'll, I'll know, like, ten people at the post office every time. So I'm, I'm here, and it's in the mall. It's in the Israeli mall. I don't, what do I know from the Israeli mall? I sit down. We got our number, and I, I went to go uh, see the, the, the digital sign, what number we, that was at. I come back, and my mom points to me about this guy. She says she, she, says she doesn't speak Hebrew. Do uh, you know what he's saying? And, and I said, I said well, you, you said to my mom something? He says, uh, Ken, you want to the bear at the Mashu? He said, yeah, I want to talk to her or something. I said, tell me. She doesn't speak Hebrew. He says, I want to tell you a Kiddush. I'm like, in Hebrew. It's all in Hebrew. I'm like, okay, tell me a Kiddush. <laughs> it's at the post office. And he says, in a, in a very paraphrased way, he's telling me a whole Kabbalistic thing. He's got no yarmulke on. He's like Ashkenazi, but a little, like, something's off in terms of he's not like a regular. So I knew there was a story there. And he's telling me, the Torah has to go out to the nations, and the nations all have a portion of Torah, and why don't the, the Haredim teach this? It has to be that everybody gets the Torah. <laughs> so I was sitting there like, this guy's teaching me gear. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I agree. He, he's thinking, why is this from guy agree? I'm saying, this is gear. It's no problem. I said, I teach that. He's like, you do? I said, yeah, you're saying like the Vilna Gone. He's like, I do? So in the end, I told him what I do, and my, my, my mother says, what was that all about? I said he tell he want to tell me about gear. She says, "How does she? How does he know you teach gear?" I said, "He doesn't." He says that was his kiddish. <laughs> wow, that must. Have, did you think that surprised you the most of anything you saw on your trip? Uh, what surprised me about it is my work is ridiculous because it's not a kiddish at all. Underneath everybody's shtusim and klipas that they have, you know what everyone's thinking about Ari gear. That's what that's the message is the Torah is universal, it's for mankind, and if you just let the message get to your heart on that level, everybody's thinking and talking about gear. This is not new what I'm doing, it's not unique. Um, it's out there. I'm maybe just the loudest voice doing it because I speak very loud. My neighbors right now are probably furious <laughs> with me. My, you know, my mother told me, Close <laughs> the window, the new neighbors are going to think you're weird for talking so loud out your window. But this is what the, this is reality. And so I asked him. I said, my mother wants to know why you're talking gear with me. He said, why would I not? That Israel's in a crisis situation. That their neighbors want to kill her. The Palestinian stuff. The Arab stuff. He said, why? Why? If the Torah went to the nations, what problems will we have? I said, well, brother, you got gear. <laughs> wow. And by the way, people should know that we are recording this at about twelve thirty in the morning. So, uh, <laughs> but so, so your neighbors are being nice for letting That's us it. do that. All right, again, this is the Messiah Hour here on Israel Sports and News Radio, and we're speaking with Rabbi David Katz, co-author of the book The World of the Gear, and author of the new hit book Somalzal.com, both available on Amazon. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, last question before we let you go: How are these experiences of your travel abroad? 
going to, I guess, motivate you or influence you moving forward? So my, the reason why we're in Modin is my mother made Aliyah. She's watching the kids. Everyone sees the kids on Facebook. Um, and she went to my, my son's school conference. And they're like, why did you move to Modine? And I'm saying, did they, re- they really just ask me that? that? That has anything to do with my son starting in second grade here? I'm thinking like, the answer is my mother likes the supermarket here better than in Svant. <laughs> so I, but uh, the reason why we are here um, is because it's close to Ben Gurion. It's close to Artie Lewis in Jerusalem. Uh, my mother That's can right. go shopping in Tel Aviv at the Israeli Mall there. Um, it's just more practical. Spot. I mean, I couldn't imagine coming home from my trip and being like, okay, we got two and a half more hours now good to go home. I just because I'm gonna start traveling worldwide. I think I'm more. Uh, we already did the Texas trip. We did now Cape Town. We're doing Chicago this trip, and then Texas at the end of the year. Next year, there's, there's traveling in mind. The goal is, um, I mean, obviously I'm an altar bucker uh, like yourself, and I'm, we're trying to find Shaduch, and we're available. My email is soulmazelgmail.com, and Ari can give his at the end of the show. Yeah, it is a sports hey, radio. Yeah, I, I support Ari. So. I support Ari. So. Yep. Yeah. Hey, how's it going, Ari? Oh, it's going good. I support Robert Kaz as well. Sorry. Yeah. Really? Um, so the idea is she's watching the kids and I'm, I'm now, uh, moving on with the development of gear and, and there's a lot of global, what do you call it? Rosh in Hebrew, like, uh, <laughs> you know, of gear and, um, it's happening. It's, it's happening. I met with the, the, the head of conversions of all of South Africa and he was highly interested. If, you know, he, he was saying that he would like me to, Speak at the World Conference in Jerusalem in July with Rabbi David Lau, the chief rabbi. So there's a lot of things happening. It's exciting. Um, I mean, there's people, I mean, just in my own personal backyard, so to speak, we got our Norway guys. And by the way, Ari, they love you. They listen to you every morning uh, or whenever we, oh, we wow. do our stuff, and they, they love your show. Uh, the World but, of the Gear just came out in Spanish, so we can see a, a Mexico City trip or a South American trip. I want to get to Norway. Texas is going to be annual. I'm now the, the you know seeing over the group in, in Cape Town, so South Africa. We set up to be an annual thing, even more than annual. Tra- traveling is part of the, is in the cards. Um, yeah, it's funny because you know there was it was such a hurricane of of Torah in Texas and in Cape Town. Uh, they actually are, they're calling me Hurricane Cats, and and that's what it was. <laughs> I mean it was it was nonstop, and we just get so much accomplished. And that's how we're going to further the gear message and awareness is the old school. Show up in person and do it the old school way. I mean, that's how you get things done. I mean, people want to type in, in, in Facebook Messenger to, to do this, and it just doesn't work. If you're not willing to get on an airplane and go and meet people and make the relationships and the connections, it's just not going to happen. Um, and it's my pleasure to do it. I mean, it's what I live for. That kind of energy is what I live for. I'm a Cohen, and that's what the, the Cohen does. And it's actually interesting. Modin is the city of the Chashmanayim, the Kohanim of Hanukkah. So I can definitely feel tapping into that energy, I mean, for sure. And that's what it's going to be. We're, we're, we're putting out more books, more travels, more groups, more networking the groups. I mean, the Texas I Get Gear is working now closely with the Cape Town I Get Nilva. And it's, it's an exciting thing and time to be a part of. Yeah, dude, certainly an interesting time, certainly a fun time, and we appreciate all that. Again, this is another episode of the Psy Hour here on Israel Sports News Radio, joined by Rabbi David Katz, co-author of the book, The World Available of the Gear. Available uh, 2895 at net. And also Someone's All, which is on uh, Amazon. And, yes, and do you think Kindle, you're free on the program? Available for, I think, $9, $7. Oh, nice, so they get a deal there. Okay, great. And it's good to have the Rabbi back in country and back on the program. And thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you to him and thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed the program and wanted to make a donation, you can do so on the right side of my website. That that donation is not for the Rabbi's book, but that's for my particular show. Uh, Rabbi, thank you for being on the program. Great job. Thanks, sorry, and I look forward to hooking up with you in Jerusalem real soon. Sounds great. And everyone out there, thank you for listening once again. Uh, be well, stay safe, and shalom from Israel. <laughs>